the machines upgrade perfectly. No oh, yeah, I they can... upgrade perfectly, but nothing will run. I haven't had anything failing to run. <laughs> it's interesting. Sorry to hear. Well, I hit the record button, so let's get our meeting started. Welcome oh, wow. to the Propeller 2 Live Forum on Tuesday, December 22nd. And uh, it's a day earlier than normal. Everybody adjusted. Thanks for that. And I guess the communication around it wasn't all that confusing. Otherwise, you would not all be here. So today we're talking about um, analog inputs. And I asked Chip to respond to a, a really simple customer inquiry where a person just wanted to see how to do some simple analog measurements. And I do too. Um, because we are now in the beginning of the process of starting to collect up things that we see and capturing them for our website um, in the form of little projects or quick bites. We aren't really sure what we're going to call them yet, but basically things that people can browse and go to and run, load and run, because um, examples are what we learn from and examples are what are missing. So my plan over, um, over the break here is to start to get a few pages of those together from some of the things I've seen here. I mean, it might be as simple as blinking an LED, measuring an analog input for starters, and then we'll just grow it from there. So um, Chip has some code, which I will retrieve from my email after he starts talking and then um, paste a link so we can all get to it. And later that code will appear on our website too. So don't worry if you don't get it along the way. <clears throat> so where we are, Today we have some uh, new people. I want to welcome them. Um, we have everybody from teachers, hobbyists, scientists to enthusiasts here. And some of us are just blinking LEDs or haven't blinked an LED and others are doing audio projects. So we're all over in terms of um, skill level and capability. And what I want to tell you about that is that it takes us a long time to get the, the pieces in order to make the to really easy to use for people. Um, a little look at our history kind of can show you how things happen, but chips been making microcontroller tools or chips really since 1997. And we end up with the silicon in our hands before we even get to finish all the tools. So we get the chips and then we put all the pressure on Jeff to make the software and then we start creating examples. But some people inevitably come to us and say, where's the book? I want the what's a microcontroller book for the P2. Where is it? Well, that takes years to get. Like, just look here, 2006, the Propeller 1 came out. I think it wasn't until 2013 we had the activity bot. And it wasn't until 2017 when we had Lockley. <laughs> so give us some time. Um, but we'll get everybody started here in due course. So everyone's, everyone's invited to join this and there's a whole lifetime of learning ahead of us with this, which is super cool. Next, actually tomorrow, um, if you'd like, you can sign up for this. So Johnny Mac is going to take us through a project where we use um, some WS2811 RGB LEDs, an LCD, a rotor encoder, real-time clock, and a temperature sensor to make a holiday light contraption of some kind. And actually, I have part of it here working on my desk, so I will show you that before I turn over to Chip. <laughs> so this is just um, my P2 Edge and my Johnny Mac board running some of the LED light code John produced and then some of the other parts that we'll be using in tomorrow's meeting. And tomorrow's meeting is the first of a series of four. And there are some parts that um, we suggest you have, but if you don't, it's okay. We have them available in a bag that keeps coming and going from Parallax because they come in stock and then you buy them and then they run out of stock. However, on our website, there's a link to all these pieces and they're all from Amazon. So you can get them if you'd like individually, but there's some cool things like a little I2C LCD and these are really low cost. It's kind of scary how cheap they are. So um, the links are on the events page of our website. 
but you can really join in without the hardware because John will, will probably give us a lot of basic introductory stuff tomorrow anyway. And this is what the parts look like. I'll share you a link to that. So they're on our site as the P2 Live Form Holiday Kit. And if you go there, you can scroll down and then browse to the various resources that go with it. Through this, John's going to give us a whole lot of new cool objects to play with. And also, um, by this time next week, we'll have Stephen Morocco's Hub 75 LED hardware in stock. And the 2495, we'll have 20, 20 boards to put out there. And I'm trying to get the panels too. He just pasted a link to the panel in the chat. And there's excellent resources that have been developed around that that are still and still being developed. Those, those I got a bunch of those panels off of uh, eBay. Ah, okay. Uh, what what uh, format did you get? Resolution and uh, number of pixels. I have to check. I was using them on. Um, I had some eighty eighty fives for some old stuff that I was using, but I'll. Let me let me look it up and I'll send it. I'll send you and a link to it. The key thing with these Ed is that they are Hub seventy five. They have a special driver with them. So all right, I'll they, look. Okay. If it's not Hub seventy five, I won't bother with it. I'll I'll let you know though. Thanks. So Chip, you want to talk A to D now? Chip, do you copy? Yeah, I just can't. Something happened, but I'm back okay. now. Do you want me to start talking? Yep. And while you start, I will go retrieve your zip Hold file. On. I'm just. I just added one file. I realized there was something we should talk. Okay, about. you can add that, then send it to me again. All right. Can you talk for another thirty yeah, seconds? Yeah, sure. Okay. So Chip um, has a zip file of several. A to D input programs from simple to like, a, I think eight or 20 of them in parallel to awesome. And the thing is with these programs that I figured out when just trying to run them is since we're in the early adopter phase still, you have to run them with peanut. Okay. And um, maybe someone can paste a link to the peanut download in the chat window. All right. Because they use the debug command and that debug command is not like serial um, formatted for parallax serial terminal, but it has the graphical controls in it. So to run these as written, you need to use peanut. But Jeff, who is here, is working to, hi Jeff, <laughs> is working to add these um, additional capabilities into the prop tool, which is our more formal release. So for those that have been hanging around here, this is you know not new news to you, nor is it confusing, but to um, newcomers, this kind of thing is sometimes a stop. But there are approximately 60 of us here who can help you out. So we ask for your forgiveness as the tools are still evolving. All right, I'm ready. OK, I'll go find your zip. <clears throat> thanks, Jeff. Right. OK, thanks. So what I'm going to talk about today is how to use the uh, ADC. I was going to do the DAX also, but I, I worked all night on this stuff and I didn't get any further, but we can do the DAX another time. They're just as simple as the ADCs. Um, but anyway, I have some stuff to show you about how the ADC works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Let me get into a folder first. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, here it is. And while Chip preps up, um, if you want to ask questions as he goes, you're welcome to do that. Just unmute yourself or type it, whatever. We don't have any formal rules here, except it's somewhat G-rated. All right. Let's see. I'm getting it. Until it's not. Switched around. Uh-oh, not found. Oh, I need power. 
And um, also, Lachlan, since you're here, will we get to see a MicroPython example of an analog input today? Yes, um, we've been using uh, LM334 temperature sensors, which are a, a really common um, current source version of the temperature sensor. It's really neat in that it's, it's only got the two wires to connect to the P2. Um, the P2 does the biasing. And the nice feature about the LM334 is that you can tune it to sit around the midpoint of the A to D. And that lets you zoom in on a signal so you get quite a good sensitivity um, when, when you apply um, a temperature change. So uh, yeah, happy, happy to run through that when you're, when you're ready. That's great, it's like Christmas time. <laughs> Must be. All right, I'll get going here, is that okay? Yep. Sure. All right, so let me share my screen. Uh, portion of screen. Okay, you should be seeing here my little peanut program. <clears throat> Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. Can you also see my camera still? Is that available in any of you? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to take my camera over to here. So I have here uh, a P2 Edge and, and, and um, uh, this Johnny Mac board. And I, I have here a little potentiometer. And I have the uh, ends of the potentiometer connected to ground and 3.3 volts. And the center tap, the wiper is going over to P0 right here. Okay, so the idea is that when we turn this potentiometer, that voltage on the center tap that goes to P0 is varying between 0 and 3.3 volts. So what I have here, can you also see the screen uh, where we have some uh, debug display going on? Yes. Yep. Okay, now if I turn this knob, we can see I'm going to turn it all the way up. We get about to 13,727 or so. If I turn it all the way down, we go to, to about 3,000. And uh, the, what's happening here is with this code right here, let me set this back. I set up here 100 megahertz. Uh, we could, it could really be anything, it doesn't matter. I've got my pin set to zero. Now to put the pin into ADC mode, it only really takes this. Uh, the pin start is a command in spin two that uh, does a short sequence of things. It resets the pin. Uh, I'm not sure on that. Actually, I should look at the description, but it then does a, a right pin, a right X pin, and a right Y pin, and then it turns the DIR high. So it, it's the process of configuring a smart pin. So in this case, we're saying we want this pin here. And then this is taken, these two values are taken from the uh, SPIN2 documentation. The PADC1X configures the, the uh, low level setup in the pin for analog input at one X of the, of the actual pin. So it's a full scale input. And then PADC selects the ADC mode. And 13 selects how many clocks, that's, a, that's an exponent. So two to the 13th, is 8192 and this is a, a sync two filter that's going on so this produces a 14-bit result that's why we saw things going towards 16k on the high end and then y was not used uh, so we just set it to zero so what this does this starts up an adc pin at that point the pin begins doing conversions it's doing 14-bit conversions and at any time we can do a read pin like this. And here's, here's our pin that we're looking at. And I write this to the variable i, and then I just output it to the debug. And I wait 100 milliseconds so we don't go too fast. So when I rerun this program and pull the debug back up, here we can see things happening. Now, you notice that when it goes all the way to one end to the other, it's not going from 0 to 16k. The reason is that this PWM thing never reaches zero or 100% duty cycle. It's, it's max, it's, it's like 
it goes between 16 and uh, 83% about. And uh, it's necessary that there be some kind of oscillation in there so that we can resolve things rapidly without having to wait too long for pulses. So this is, to, to read, um, you know, to register this to, to zero volts and 3.3 volts requires another step. It's, just, it's like a line equation where what you'd want to do, the, the ADC has internal uh, calibration settings. You can connect the ADC and set up to the pin at 1x. You can connect it to uh, ground and, and VIO, which is 3.3 volts. And you could take measurements at both of those points and you could solve for a line equation. So you come up with a, a scaling factor and an offset. It's like the old Y equals MX plus V problem. And I'll show in a little bit uh, a program. In fact, I can show next what that looks like. But wait, first I'm gonna do some, a few other simpler things that build on what we have here. So you can see that to, to get a, a smart pin going in ADC mode, it's really no, there's nothing to it. Uh, this is all explained in the silicon documentation and then pin start is briefly covered right now in, in the spin two documentation. But once you set up a pin in this mode, which is gonna be sync two, this, this puts it in sync two mode, 13 bit. All you have to do after that is just go and pick up the samples whenever you want them. Now you could, you could set this up in assembly language so it alerts you every time a conversion is done so that you have everything, you know, that can be your time meter. Or, or you could pull it and you get an event. You'll know that a new sample has been resolved so you can go pick that up and, and use it. So this is doing one pin. Now are there any questions so far about this? Chip, you said yeah. that um, the clock frequency doesn't really matter. No. Uh, can not at all. No. Well, you know, I mean, I've at, at some point it does, but I can set it as low as ten megahertz. I mean, that's what we need to do debug, and uh, we can see the values that are coming out. Here's one end, and then uh, if I go to the other end, it's it's close. Like, let's look at that top end value. 13,740. Now I'm going to switch things over to like 300 megahertz, right? We're going to go 30 times faster. Now we're at 13,720. It went down by 20 counts or maybe about 0.1%. So, but that can be, that can be taken out with a calibration procedure. So this thing can work over a wide frequency range. In fact, while we're on this, let me just show a picture. This is actually something that someone made uh, it's on, on the uh, forum and they posted it. Let me slide this thing into view here. Can you guys see this little picture? Yeah. You see a schematic? We do. Yeah. Okay. So this is a simplified drawing of, of what the ADC is. It's actually pretty simplistic. It's more complicated in the implementation because we have some very high impedance uh, current sinks and sources with, some, with an active load it can switch between to keep the, the noise on the capacitor here very, very low. But what happens is these are just digital. You see these two uh, inverters in series. That's literally all they are. They're just logic inverters in series. And we actually have six of them in the ADC. Um, but we show two of them here just to get the point across. Six of these things in a row, of course, are going to make a very fine decision based on what's coming into the, into the first inverter. It gets amplified up, and by the time you get to the D, the D input of the flip-flop, resolved to a zero or a one. On the clock, that gets latched, and then immediately, the inverse of that is fed back through this high impedance current source and sink back to the integrator cap. So this is the process we use. It's called a delta sigma A to D converter. And it's, it's very simple in principle and uh, it's pretty effective. It has very high linearity. And uh, in our case, because we have very high impedance current sinks and sources, it really doesn't matter what the input threshold is of these inverters. Because it's not just the input threshold of the first inverter, it's the set of all six together because as it feeds through all the inverters, um, those 
the first inverter has the most effect on the threshold, but the second is contributory all the way out to the sixth. But that voltage in the first inverter is going to be not always the same. It's going to vary from A to D to A to D. It's going to vary based on what the supply voltage is. But because we use high impedance current feedback, that doesn't matter. That gets kind of pulled out of the equation. So this doesn't need to be exactly VDD over two. It doesn't need to be 1.65 volts. It might be 1.6 or 1.8 or it's all dependent upon these tiny little inverters that have to make a very quick decision. So this is the whole feedback loop. And this thing can run at hundreds of megahertz. There's not a lot going on. So that's what's at the core of the ADD right there. And we Chip, do have, what's yeah. the max sample rate with 14-bit resolution? OK, so 14-bit resolution takes 8,000 clocks, 8192 clocks to resolve, right? So um, we could say, let's say, our, let's say we're running at 300 megahertz. Let's see, one, two, three, divided by 8192. Uh, it would run at 36 kilohertz for uh, a 14-bit sample, right? But if you wanted, uh, we could multiply this by two for 13-bit samples. You go <clears throat> 73 kilohertz. If you want a 12-bit sample, that could be 146 kilohertz. If we multiply that by 16, uh, 2.343 megahertz for 8-bit conversions. Chip, how do you specify the number of bits? Is that the 13 in your uh, program? Yeah, it's not. A, yeah, Ken thought it was a carriage return, but it's, it's 13, meaning do 2 to the 13th clocks for the conversion. And because we're using a SYNC2 SI filter, we wind up with um, one more bit resolution than that. So over 8192 clocks, we resolve uh, 14 bits. And that is about the practical limit of the A to D hardware in the pad. Uh, <clears throat> if everything is set up nicely, you can, you can get between 13 and 14 bits of resolution. Um, but it doesn't make any sense to go any higher than that. At that point, you're dealing with noise inside the ADC and you really can't resolve better. I'd like to, at some point, if you know, things go forward well, I'll redesign the ADC and improve it in a few ways. I'll improve the noise floor and I'll improve the conversion rate by adding maybe 15 parallel integrators so that we can get four bits per clock instead of one. <laughs> anyway, okay, I'll pull this out. So that's how the AD were, ADC. So is that helpful as a simple example for one channel A to D for everybody? Uh, it's very simple, but uh, I'd like to uh, understand uh, <clears throat> how accurate, how stable is the conversion? That is in terms of DC, for example, if I put in a uh, volt 0.65, uh, will I get a volt 0.65 over? Yes. No? Oh. Yes, you're right. Uh, will it stay <laughs> or will it wander? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, well, well let's, let's do that. I'm gonna, I'll jump to another, okay, I'll just zoom. We're gonna come back to some stuff I was gonna hit later, but I have a thing here called ADC to millivolt. All right, so let me expand the window here a little bit. Now what this program does is it launches another cog. Let's see, how big is this thing? Well, I'll just, I'll just let it be this big. So we have up here, here's our program. Instead of doing a, 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 what do we call a pin start, we're doing a cog in it to actually launch an app in another cog. And then we use a debug to show what, what it's doing. And this is going to do a conversion on a set of eight pins that are all in a row. So what this program does here is it configures eight contiguous IO pins to be ADC inputs. And then through this process right here, it's kind of a, a state, stateful process that it goes through. Every process or every, every state, it does a, let's see, <clears throat> I think I used, where's my right pin? Uh, let's see, right here, you see this nine? Mm -hmm. So that's gonna do a 10-bit conversion, okay, in, in 512 clocks. And it's going to do eight of them per pin. And it does this over time. And uh, 
So every, every state, it, it converts all eight pins, but what it does is it adds them together and then interleaves in this fashion. You see this table down here of like what happens when. Mm -hmm. See the cycle. So the first cycle, it, uh, it takes all the conversions and adds them to their different level bins. And, and what's, the purpose of, what's the purpose of this? It's why, are, uh, why are you, uh, if, if I have an A to, A to D, and if I want to have a single uh, accurate uh, DC uh, representation, in, uh, a digital representation of a DC voltage, and I want it to be stable for, uh, for, from sample to sample, uh, do I have to average a lot of them in order to get that result? That is, will it stay, will it stay like a voltmeter? Well, well, I'll show you. We'll run this and we'll see what it does and you'll see yeah, but why do we need eight? I mean, what, why are we talking about eight? Uh, uh, just because, well, it, because we can do eight. That's the only oh. reason. There is no... So what you're saying is here we have eight voltmeters. Yes. Giving us eight outputs and, and uh, it's going to, and you are, and actually you're answering my question. So I have to assume that the proof of the stability will be that all eight will stay the same. Right, right. They all run independently. So Is that the, was that the, the reason that you you're doing this for me? Yeah, this is like an instrumentation type ADC. Example. Yeah. Okay. That's want, that's what I, that's uh, okay. Yeah. So you see, just all by itself, the A to D converter can resolve dynamic signals very nicely. There's no need to calibrate anything if you don't care about absolute DC level. However, yeah. if you want to do some kind of instrumentation work. You, you yes. need to do calibration. So see, yes. there, there we have all these, these uh, states that we go through, these cycles, and then in each, uh, each cycle we have, well, let's see, how do I break this thing down? We have, we have four states that we go through, zero through three. So what we do is we have to be looking at the ground and the 3.3 volt reference and, and doing conversions for those as well. So what we do is we interleave, we do a ground calibration, a signal calibration. We do a ground calibration, a signal measurement, a power, nice. power calibration, then another signal measurement. So every other measurement is for signal and every one in between is for either calibrating power or ground. The, uh, yeah, I see. And that would mean, for example, for your, uh, since you, you can do 14 bits in uh, 30, about 30,000 times a second, uh, that would mean that actually the, the top most for accurate instrumentation grade conversions would be 10,000 times a second. Yeah, something, it could, it, yeah, it could be something like that. Okay. It's a little okay. bit squishy and it's very dependent on how well you keep your power supplies quiet. The, the, the power supply to the set of four pins that the A to D is working on, because we have unique power pins for every set of four IOs. So what we have on, on our P2 edge module and our P2 evals, we have very low noise, low dropout regulators to generate those local 3.3 volt supplies. Fantastic. Yeah. One thing, I'd, uh, if I may interrupt for one more question from this, you know, I'm, I'm in France and it's very late. So uh, I noticed in P1, the P1 A to Ds, you, uh, you have, the circuit shows two capacitors, one to, to positive and one to negative to the inputs, right? Yeah. Why, why, how does that work? I mean, I, I uh, you know, I, I don't it's have only, much care. Okay, huh? so an, an integrator really only needs, I'll pull my little drawing back in here. An integrator yep. only, only needs need one, one. one cap in theory, right? Right. But in, in practice, it's good to break that cap into two parts. Bias one part to ground and bias the other part to the, power, the positive power supply. So what you get is like common noise rejection. Uh-huh, so, so that it, it's a matter of... Uh, Balancing out the noise. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, so yeah. in our implementation in the chip, we actually have, you know, caps to ground and caps to 3.3 volts. Uh -huh. is, is this cap inside the uh, P2? 
Yeah, oh, everything. Yeah, this is all oh. inside the chip now. This so, is so why that, that, that that is an improvement then from the P1. Uh, roughly, yeah, but we, but it's a it's a much better circuit. It's a lot lower noise. See, uh -huh. the trouble with the P1 is there's a lot of turnaround time involved in getting a pin to go all the way into the into the counter, then latching it, you know, and then out re outputting yeah. the opposite back over the I/O pin. Well, this is literally what goes on in the chip. <coughs> so I see there are no prop there are no longer these long propagation delays. Instead of propagation delays totally maybe 12 nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. This propagation delay is like one and a half or two nanoseconds. Fantastic. I, 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 I get it. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's a major improvement. Yeah, and, we, and there's a lot of stuff I could do to improve this some more. I'd like to have the chance in the future um, <laughs> because I think we could just keep making it better and better. And it's a very small circuit. Every pin has one. And uh, also what we have... Uh, this is, there's actually an analog front end where you see this pin pad coming in. There's a, a resistor there and we can actually in, in the P2, you can select which resistor you want to go through. So we actually have a, 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 we have one X mode and it's all, it's done logarithmically uh -huh. over six steps. We have one X, 3.1 X, 10 X, 31 X and 100 X. Fantastic. Yeah. And so when you get to the 100 X mode, you have a voltage, a full voltage span of like 33 millivolts, or maybe maybe 40 millivolts, because you know before you hit zero to 100 percent duty cycle. So uh -huh. if you can AC couple, just bring it, bring an an AC signal in through a small capacitor. You could feed it to the AD, ADC. The ADC will auto DC bias it where it needs it to be to mm -hmm. do this process, and you mm -hmm. can resolve all kinds of AC signals. So you could demodulate carriers and do all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, great. <laughs> so I'll show you this, this program we have here. So this looks like a lot of monkey motion. I mean, there's a lot of steps here, but in order to be able to do that, solve this line equation with repetitive recalibrations that are needed, you have to make a program to do this. Right? It wouldn't really suffice to go measure ground. And other stuff goes on too. When you, switch the, when you switch the resistor around inside the ADC, you have to go through a little dead time to allow the circuit to settle. Right? It's nice if yeah. you have the same signal coming in all the time, but once you switch away and you go to something else, there's all sorts of new DC stasis that have to level out mm -hmm. you know, to get below an LSB before you can start converting again. So that's what this little program does. It's an assembly language program. And from beginning to end, here's, here's, the, uh, here's some data for it. But the code mm -hmm. is, uh, the main loop of the code is, is just what you see on the screen here, right mm -hmm. here. That's the main loop of the code. And this runs on an interrupt. And then mm -hmm. up here at the top, this is the whole setup for it, where it says ADC program setup. I didn't know you had interrupts in, uh, in parallax. We do in the P2. Yeah, now we, we used to have in the P2 hot, which was an intermediate thing we were working on, but it was going to take eight watts if we implemented it. It was not uh -huh. practical. So we had like, um, uh -huh. like multi, how would we, there's a word for it, preemptive multitasking where every clock, every two clocks, we would switch from one set of program counters and flags to the other. And so you could actually have four concurrent programs running, which was really cool. But because you could have a, a cog running four separate programs, taking care of things all in high bandwidth. But that wasn't, that just took too much hardware, too many flops. It was going to run too hot. So yeah. I had to redo things and I added interrupts because now we can't run programs on such a tight timing basis. But with the smart pins, which can go out and tell you when something has completed, you can Fantastic, use that yeah. to trigger an interrupt and then deal with it. So this program here, um, in fact, look, here's the main, here's the main loop of the program Whoop, right here. It doesn't do anything, okay? Because this ADC ISR right below here, this is mm -hmm. what runs on the interrupt. 
this is the main loop. You could actually put a whole bunch of code there to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, it's really no. doing this ADC process in the background. It, it becomes transparent after, uh, after you, 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 you simply have an ADC uh, yes. logically and mentally and uh, theoretically <laughs> or not yeah. theoretically in practice. Uh, you can forget all of that once once you have uh, once you know what your your parameters are going to be. And, you know, excuse yeah. Yeah. And, and and this could run. Th this could even run within the spin two interpreter. I had I have a version of this that runs. This thing runs in the spin two interpreter, interrupting your 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 code as it executes. But, but you never know that. It just takes little pieces of time here and there. Yeah. Um, the trouble is though, when I wanted to do this debug business, it was taking so much time from the interpreter and, and blocking interrupts that this thing here would kind of like lose sync. Uh -huh, it, yeah. it stole enough time that it, 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 it must have been one of your pleasurable moments. <laughs> well, I had to redo the way it works. So I took the program and put it into another cog. But mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could make it do a lot more right here, right? I mean, you're not using the streamer or anything. You could, you could do a whole another application right there, but I had to separate it from the spin two cog that was doing the debug stuff because the debug was stealing too many cycles. Uh -huh. so, yeah. so what this thing, it's saying here, uh, whenever we configure any kind of pin for anything, you can actually do multi, you can do up to 32 pins at once. So this add pins operator here. Chip, you got to run this code pretty soon. Control F10. Right. I'll run the code. So what it's going to do, it's going to take from pin zero to pin seven, and it's going to run all these parallel conversions on it, right? And uh, so let's see, I'm going to hit, and I'll drag this up here so that we can see it. So I have, oh, yeah. I have, so that's eight, and these are millivolts, right? It's resolving down to millivolts. You mean it's 3.293 millivolt? No. Uh oh, it's three thousand two hundred ninety-three millivolts. Aha. Uh -huh. And but so, that's, I, that's, three, turn, that's almost three point. That's almost positive supply then. Yeah, it's 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 connected yeah, okay. to positive supply. Now, as I turn that potentiometer down, all okay. the way to zero, there. Great. How about uh, turning it halfway? Okay. Exactly and halfway chip. And not <laughs> breathing on, and don't breathe on the <laughs> Okay, okay. Here I know what you're looking Let me for. see. Well, I want to see this. Okay, there okay. I'm not I'm not touching it. 1.644, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.6472, 1.
Oh no no it's oh, oh no I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's not three point. No, it's, it's not three point something millivolts. It's three point. It's three point something volts. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. So millivolts. See, we're using an underscore like in lieu of a comma uh -huh. in America, right? Okay. So if I turn it all the way up, it's the three thousand two hundred ninety nine millivolts. So it's all the way up at the top. Now I can take my. Let me get a little jumper here, and I will jump. Uh, I'll take ground. I'm going to connect ground. I'm just going to hardwire it to P0. So this is the first column. There. Now I've got uh, the first input is now connected to ground. 3.2. Yeah, see the first column, oh, yeah. how it's like 0, 1, 3, 4. Right. These. And I, you know, I, now this yeah, is the um, this is the P2 edge. If I do this on the uh, on the P2 eval, it might be a little bit quieter because mm -hmm. the, the PCB layout was, was uh, more careful. But in the future, I want to redo the way I, inside the ADC on the pad, I want to redo the resistor arrangement and I'll get a lot better calibration. So we can go like, we can probably calibrate to like 0.1 millivolts. Whereas right now you see we're jumping around a few millivolts. Yep. Especially towards ground. It's funny thing. It doesn't happen on the top end. It happens on the bottom end. I'm uh, not really sure why that is. Hey, Chip, regarding the auto biasing, um, can you run your fingers over those middle pins? Yeah. Oh, good idea. Okay. So let me let me do that. So <laughs> let me free up some stuff here. Unplug some things. I'm gonna I'm gonna unplug everything. How, there. how right. many uh, how many pins like that you have that could float? 32 or 64? You, you could do all, you could do every single pin this way. So now they're all floating, right? So I'm going to put my finger, I'm going to touch ground and then I'm going to touch the four pins. Okay, I'm touching ground now. And if I let off, it goes up a little bit. So let me lick my finger. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now, now I took my finger back off. How about static? Uh, well, the pin is designed to withstand 2KV human body model. So uh -huh. it would, it, if it got zapped, you, you'd see your reading probably jump up or down just briefly. Yep. If I had a bunch of jumpers, I could actually, uh, you know, short all these to ground. Well, okay, well, I'll do this. I'll take 3.3 volts. I'm going to connect zero to 3.3 volts. So the first one is now... Uh, let's see, wait, why isn't that doing anything? Oh, it, yeah, the first one is now tied to the power supply. You see it's reading 3,293 millivolts. Now I'll connect like pin four, right? That's the fifth one in is now connected to the power supply. Cloud. Clear. Yeah, so it, if, if I can get, if, if we have the chance in the future to redesign the ADC, I'm going to clean this up quite a bit. So we're going to get these things trimmed a lot better and we'll have higher conversion rates. Now I'm going to unplug everything. So now they're all floating again. But uh, dynamically, for example, when you're, you're uh, um, A to D audio or music, uh, you would, uh, this would not be such a problem. No. That it, the, the noise could be filtered out because it's actually very high frequency, right? Yeah, and you don't care about, you don't care about DC when you're listening, when, when you're recording no, audio. So, absolutely, yeah. So you can, you can completely skip all this calibration stuff. See, yeah. Calibration slows things way down. And, and it's, now there's a, there's a big problem that we can't get away from, although better design could probably fix it a little bit. There's this phenomenon called one over F as in frequency, one over F noise. So yeah. you really want to be able to take your conversions in the smallest time possible to eliminate one over F noise. But when you have to do multiple like calibration readings and signal readings, the you time one set stretches out and you get more of this noise that it, it's like, it's like a rumbly. It's like low frequency rumbly noise. It's and shock noise. It's maybe it is. It's just it's like it's like just random noise, but it's low frequency in nature. It's not high frequency. I mean, it, it goes down to 
zero millihertz. You know, it's very low, low noise, it but... Yeah. It increases six dBs per octave. Yes, yes. Yeah, so this is another thing. But this is how the ADC is working right now. Now I'll show you, um, I'm gonna close this thing. Let's okay, see. and does anybody else have a question they're afraid to ask? Now's a good time while Chip switches gears. Lachlan had one in the chat window there. He was asking Chip, uh, the P1 pin diodes were rated for 500 microamps. Are the P2 diodes similar? Oh, you mean like the substrate diodes? Uh, I'd say probably like 30 milliamps or something. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, you, you could do a lot more than that even, but uh, I think if you exceeded like 200 milliamps, you could have a latch up problem. Um, but that's, you know, that's only going to happen if you're connecting things to pins that you probably shouldn't like, you know, motors and weird loads and things that, you know, would require not, like some kind of transistor interface too. All right, let me s see here. Uh, I'm going to load and grab another file here. Oh. Ken, this is, uh, this is one of those uh, lectures that we're going to have to look at many, many times. You're recording it and you're going to post it, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I have questions I'm afraid to ask that I don't want to <laughs> ask Chip to repeat 20 minutes of what he said, but I'm still wondering why the other seven channels were showing a similar value to the pot. But Oh, but no, they weren't similar. They were just the floating stasis values. I see with nothing connected. Nothing on them. Yeah, with nothing on them, those pins are going to float near the middle. And okay. so they're very, they're like 470 K ohms. It's very high impedance. So it doesn't take a whole lot to influence Got them. It. But left to themselves, they're just going to float somewhere in the middle. But the signal that you're driving into them is going to overcome that high impedance. Just not used to what to do with the abundance of A to Ds. <laughs> I mean, my prior experience is like in ADC 0831 with one or two channels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, it's, it's it's very exciting to have so many. I think it's it's a it's a challenge, and it's a, it'll be very interesting for someone to, to do something with it. For example, uh, connect. I just bought uh, something like twenty piezo. Uh, um, micro uh, electric uh, microphones with leads, but well, I could imagine those connecting all 20 to, your, to the P2 and getting something off. I don't know what, it, what it's going to be, but uh, it might be interesting. Are you interested in audio inputs then? I'm, o I'm mostly, in, I'm interested in both DC and audio. Audio is my field, but DC is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm into analog uh, synthesizers, music synthesizers. Well, and I know have some friends here. In interested i know chip is interested in music yeah so, oh yeah yeah I, I i was the one years ago i think um, that asked uh, chip to uh, talk about uh, fourier fourier transforms and how the p1 did it and uh, i i suspect that this the p2 will do be able to to do it uh, very oh. elegantly elegantly and uh, of course yeah, i'm not a code, unfortunately, unfortunately i'm not a coder i'm a very good analog designer and uh, that that may be the uh, the membrane through which i may not be able to pierce <laughs> into <laughs> using the p2 because <laughs> uh, but it's exciting you know so I have some, the, the P2 with the Cordic is really nice for the, for the uh, FFT because you can do one coordinate rotation and it takes care of like four discrete normal uh, steps to compute the, because uh, the, really what, what all this sine and cosine transformation does in the FFT, mm -hmm. it's a coordinate rotation. It, it, it all is about rotating an, an X and a Y around zero comma zero. So we can do that with one instruction in with the cortex, and it turns out really nicely. Uh, it, it it simplifies the heck out of the out of the FFT. So all you wind up looking at is a couple of discrete ads, and then all of the funny pointer movement, you know, increment and test and 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 loop. 
And I don't, I don't know what that file's called, but it's in here somewhere. Chip, while you get your next uh, demo ready, I'm wondering if we should have intermission and see some MicroPython. Yeah, sure. If everybody That's can good. tolerate the break for a moment. Okay, let me, let me do a stop share here. Okay. Lachlan, are you okay with that? Yep. Great. We'll go to Australia then, where it's the middle of summer. It is, although it doesn't feel like it today. But uh, look, we're, um, we've been experimenting with MicroPython and the LM334 current sensors, um, which translate temperature into, a, um, into a, uh, an analog current signal. Um, one nice thing about using the P2 is that you can use the inbuilt BIOS resistor, um, 15K BIOS resistor, to, uh, to get results. Um, I should just say also that these um, screen captures and code and everything I've posted into the P2 forum um, this morning, so that, um, or this afternoon, your time, so that you can see, um, you know, code and screenshots if you want to try this out for yourselves. Um, I'm just going to, maybe, maybe I can do a screen share here, that might be the way to go. And it's my hope, uh, Lachlan, to take that example and to uh, put it on the Propeller 2 section of the website. Sure. Okay, so um, let me just bring up. Okay, so this is the uh, the LM three three four temperature sensor as we're using it hooked up to the P two evaluation board. Um, the red wire here is connected to three point three volts on the corner of the um, header, and the white wire here is the analog signal, the current output, which goes into pin P nineteen on the P two evaluation board. This potentiometer here is a 10 turn potentiometer, which allows you to set the operating point. And what we are able to do is actually make this operate around that sensitive 1.65 volt region of the A to D that, you know, that Chip was describing how the, um, the pins sort of float around that region. Um, every A to D pin on the P2 has a, has a built in zoom capability. Um, and so you can zoom in on signals around that range and that'll be useful for things like microphones, um, the piezo sensors as well, probably, um, mm -hmm. that Sergi was, was just talking about. Um, so this is a good example of actually being able to zoom in on a signal and, and, um, and, you know, get sort of extra sensitivity out of the, out of the P2 pins. Um, so that's our, that's our configuration. Um, here's the data sheet for the LM134 or the 234 or 334. Those, they're all the same device, but just with different temperature ranges. They're not super accurate, but the big advantage is that you can buy them from pretty much any electronic shop. Um, I think Digikey and Mouser sell them for about 80 cents each. Mm. And of course, with the P2, you can put one of these on every single pin if you want to or if you need to. Um, all right, so crossing into Mu. Um, this is just a static screenshot of our code in Mu. Um, down in the bottom left corner, we've got the MicroPython interactive window, like a terminal. And in the bottom right, we've got a plot of the temperature that, that um, the temperature sensor is seeing, which will show running live. I just want to show in the code how easy it is to set up a, um, a, a smart pin for something like this. Um, we're basically MicroPython telling it that we have a pin 19 that we're interested in and we can use a shorthand of P, just a short uh, single variable P for uh, referring to that pin from then on. What we then do is configure the right pin to have a 15k ohm pull down resistor. We want to turn on the analog to digital converter with a 10 times zoom range, which means it looks at that 1.65 volts plus or minus 165 millivolts, so in that kind of range. Um, we want to count how many high pulses there are out of Chip's um, ADC converter circuit. And this TT bit uh, at the end just enables the analog to digital conversion at the same time as biasing the, the pin with a 15K resistor. 
We then tell it that we want to take 1 million samples at a time. Um, this is kind of an accumulation bucket, and, and it just means that um, the HD converter will, will go out and take 1 million zero or one readings before returning a result. And so mm -hmm. if you had the thing exactly at 1.65 volts at midpoint, you should get a return of 500,000. Um, we turn the pin off, which seems counterintuitive, but that's just to enable this 15K bias resistor. So we're outputting a low and that brings that 15K low bias resistor into play. And um, then we go into a plotting routine here where we take a number of results every 150 milliseconds and plot them in the graph. Um, so what I'll do now, I'll cut across to the live new screen and we will click run here and let it start accumulating samples, which it's doing now. And you'll see how the graph in the bottom right hand corner is updating. If I um, put my fingers on the temperature sensor, I can increase the temperature and it'll sort of zoom in a bit closer in a moment. So that's increasing the temperature. Let's hit run again. This time I've got the can of freeze spray here, which I'll take the temperature down negative. I'm applying that now and you can see there's a big temperature dip and then I'll put my fingers back on again and it'll warm it up fairly quickly. So this is a combination, fairly simple demonstration of mu and what it's quite good at doing, just plotting results into a, um, into a, um, into a graph in the bottom corner there. Um, so this is pretty much it. This is just a simple demonstration of how to read a current sensor. Um, the nice thing about the LM334 is that you can set that bias level so that you really do get close in. And what we can do, we can go into the 100 times zoom range and zoom in and you'll see that, um, uh, so instead of these values here being sort of plus or minus a few hundred thousand, you should get even more now. Um, actually, let me just check. It might be a bit ambitious, maybe we go 30 times. The HDs also have a, have a one, a three, a 30 and a hundred times zoom. Um, all right, so this is a 30 times zoom. Putting my finger on the sensor now and you can see that's quickly heating up. And you'll note there's not a lot of noise there. I mean, it, it, there is when you sort of zoomed in a, a super close way. Okay, we're actually clipping, we're going sort of, you know, we're, we're actually hitting the, uh, the limits of um, where the sensor reads. So look, practically probably 10 times zoom is the right way to go with that sensor. Um, I've posted this code and screenshots and examples and everything into the P2 forums. So this thread here, um, connecting P2, um, has got the, um, the screenshots. Um, and then just finally, I was gonna shout out to Tracy Allen from EME Systems who did this neat um, document on um, how to construct a little LM334 probe um, using heat shrink and you know just a practical guide to how to build this thing. Instead of using a 226 ohm resistor we're using about 635 to, to work with the P2 um, but you know there, there are re reasons that depending on where you want to sort of measure most accurately you can change that resistor. It's pretty straightforward. Lachlan a quick question for you. Line yeah. nine of your Python code so now I see how it works because you explained it but prior to you showing it today um, how would I have figured out how to do the A to D? Right, so chip, chip spin two documentation um, has a, a list of commands you can send to the pins or a list of predefined constants which you can configure the pins with as shorthand for, um, for setting up the A to Ds. It's the same thing um, you showed in spin then? Yes, yeah, it's, it. It, we use the same constants as, as you used in spin and I think it also in FlexProp GUI um, you know, I think the same constants are available. So at least we've got the the um, the same um, tags, I guess, for setting up pins and, and configuring the, the the different modes and configurations. <coughs> yeah, they are the same in FlexProp also. Yep. Nice. Any other questions for Lachlan? Yeah, I was wondering if you could show us uh, where you uh, do that beautiful strip chart graph in your code. So that's just down in this section here. Um, 
first of all, we just take a baseline reading, which gives us effectively a zero. And that just means everything's always centered on zero, no, ma no, ma no matter where it sits in the range, we always effectively start from zero. Um, so it just displays that baseline value. And then after that, it goes into this loop here. And all that loop is doing is taking a p.read pin, which retrieves the latest result, takes subtracts off that baseline to make it sort of reference to zero. And that is outputting, if you look at the terminal down here, you'll just see that it's just putting brackets around a value um, in, um, in, in mu. And that basically sets a, like a tuple that, that um, mu is programmed to interpret this. And if you have a comma and more than one value, it will display more than one trace. That's something we can probably do another week, um, you know, with a, with a multi-channel um, multi -channel version. I don't think this will, so, so you can see here, this is running four or five channels. And although, because I haven't got things hooked up, these are sort of um, um, all coincident. You can sort of yeah. see there's five channels in there. So you're basically just sending a vector of, of readings in to Mu. And that to be will, clear, um, it's, a, it's a feature of Mu that does the graphical display from great. the text output. It's not any Python code. Right. When we get some time, we'll also do this with a with a, a debug display, so that you could do the same thing from Spin. Um, you know, at the moment we can only do that with Propeller Tool, but um, uh, so, uh, sorry, with Peanut. But w when that sort of goes into Propeller Tool, we could do the same thing there, and effectively get a like a debug display happening inside of of the uh, Propeller Tool environment. Very nice job. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ken put us onto Mu. He's been using it for a lot of educational um, workshops, and um, you know, initially we we thought it's um, maybe it's sort of fairly focused on on just getting results and things. But sometimes that's what you need to get going, you know. And then after that, you can always translate and build on this, and you can actually build pretty complicated programs. I know um, Brian or Ozprop Dev, who who's here in the in the uh, in the conference today, has built things with around a thousand lines of code. Um, in Mu successfully, so yeah. Thanks, Lachlan. No problem. That's another example we'll, we'll harvest for the website. I just ordered 10 LM334s while you were talking so I could set them up on 10 channels and get out a torch and do graphing of That's waves. Chip, still with us? Yep, yep. Thanks for that, Lachlan. <laughs> Can you guys see this screen here? Yes. Okay, so you remember the first one, the first simple example? It just had zero, right? So now we're doing 16 pins. So we can start up 16 ADCs all at once because this value pins has these upper bits added by add pins that say how many other, other pins to add in. So this line is actually the same exact line in the first simple example. But now we have to go down here and we have to read all those samples separately in a loop, right? So I have this samples buffer right here and we load it up right here. Once it's loaded, we can then output that as an array to the debug screen. So when I run this, we can see now we are, we're getting 16 conversions. And Sergey, you were thinking about stability. Well, look, here's the thing. When we don't have to go through those extra calibration steps, we get much better signaling. You can see that the, uh, the well, my conversion count is lower. I'm only doing a, a 10 bit conversions. So let me go to back all the way up to like a 14 bit conversion. I'll rerun this thing. Um, let's see. <laughs> Zoom is making my things kind of funny here, but okay, now the, I, on the first column there, that's pin zero. That's where I have my. Uh, potentiometer connected. So if I take it all the way down to ground, you can see mm -hmm. we're only getting a couple LSBs of movement. 
right? It's pretty, and this is out of a 14-bit conversion. If I crank it all the way up high, we're getting a few steps of noise in this mm -hmm. conversion. So if you don't have to do, if you can get by without the calibration, you can get better quality conversions. Yeah, I see. Okay, so we could expand this to 32 as well. But what I did here for that demo, because that gets to be too wide, we can't see it all at once, right? So um, I have, let's see, here we go. So now this example will do 32 pins, right? <laughs> and, but I'm gonna use a debug terminal so that we can see it all because I have to reformat the way the data is displayed. So now <laughs> we use a debug terminal, it's gonna improve things, but we still go and fetch the samples, but now we display them using this debug terminal. So when I run this, uh, let's see, where did, <clears throat> let's see, uh, <clears throat> Windows, there's a funny thing that goes on between the Zoom software and my app. Let me, oh, here we go. All right, it appeared up here. So now I can bring this into here. Ah. So now this is better formatted, right? So it's easier to see. So we're, on, we're at zero, zero, that's, that's pin zero, right? So that's all, all right. the way up. I'll, I'll turn the pot all the way down. There it is okay. at the bottom now. I'm gonna move that center tap all the way to P31. So it's now gonna be the last one. Uh, okay. Yeah, see the very bottom one? Yep. It's up at 13,000. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can turn it all the way down to 3,042. So, so here it's converting 32 pins yeah, and terrific. then displaying. So you, and you, you could do the other part, you could do all 64 pins, but it would take two steps, right? Because you can only mm -hmm. address a block of 30 pins have to be addressed in sets of 32 of which there are two sets on this chip. So this is all pin zero through 31 or zero, zero through one F running conversions, just open loop. And you can go and uh, at any time you can, you can grab the samples like this, just read them in and then put them into an array or you, you could make an assembly program to always deposit them into an array. So that's always available. Okay, so, so that's the same thing. Now, there's one other thing I've prepared here. Uh, let's see, is this it? Yeah, okay. So the, uh, the pins have a couple of modes. There's a, there's a, you can just straight read the ADC bit stream. You can, you, can, you can read it in blocks of 32 bits at a time and get the exact data that came out of the ADC. You could run a, 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 a totalizer like what uh, Lachlan was doing, where he'd, he'd look mm -hmm. for a million clocks and come up mm -hmm. with how many were ones. But the sync two filtration is better because it, it, it's, it's gapless. It takes care of the endpoints, which become noisy. Noisy because it's like you're breaking, a, a, you're splintering a, a, a stick, and now you've got shards. With overlapped sync two or sync three filtration, you get rid of those, those endpoint issues, so you get very smooth samples. Um, so we have sync two and sync three filtering. Sync three filtering resolves like um, more bits than sync two. I think it adds like uh, a couple more, or how, is it even double? I think um, I have it in the docs. I'm not. It's not not clear in my head right now. But aside from sync two and sync three filtering and being able to totalize or capture the actual bit stream, we have what are called scope modes. So that in the pin, and let me, let me pull up a, uh, I had a document ready to go here. Let's see, hold on. I'm gonna, hopefully I can slide this into the window. Uh, the, does debug have a scope mode in which we, you can just see waveforms at the place of numbers? Oh yeah, we've got, yep, we're gonna use it right here. Um, uh -huh. Okay. Get so, ready. <laughs> oh, here's my problem. Okay, so I'm going to go down to the smart pin. Oops. Okay, so check this out. I'm going to try to move this into the window where the Zoom share is happening. This will keep you awake past midnight in France. Yes, it's already 12:15. Okay. <laughs> but okay. I'm ready. <laughs> and you see these these filters? Ah. So 
with it oh, and the cool. smart pin, there are Very different, good. there are flip flops. And what we can do is we can treat them as a big, like a, uh, like a chain, right? So we shift the bits into this big chain of flip flops. We have maximum a 68 tap two key filter and guys on the forum help work all this out. But what's really uh -huh. neat, the way, this, the way this filter works is imagine you have all these bits, these single bits from the ADC, they're sliding through this filter, right? Mm -hmm. And they're weighted. So that what you do is you, 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 you multiply the zero or one for the bit times whatever the level is for that tap and you sum them all together on every single clock. But that seems, that's too much silicon to compute, but we found that we could double integrate and use the incoming bits and outgoing bits and certain bits at certain tap points. And we could control these integrator values to actually realize these filter functions with nothing more than like a eight bit adder or compound <laughs> adders. Actually, I think it was more, more than, it's like maybe a 13 bit adder, but we, talk, we take the top eight bits. So we can, in scope mode, we, we, can, we can realize these filter functions so that every single clock you get an eight bit sample out. But it's okay. not, it's eight bits in magnitude, but it's really not eight bits in quality because of 68 taps, you've only got just a little over six bits of real DC resolution, right? Because the mm -hmm. log, two of 68 is gonna be six point something. Mm -hmm. So, but it, but it looks better than that when you see the waves, waveform. So here's... I see. Oh, wait, 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 I moved the wrong thing. Let me get this out of the way. Okay, back, back to this program now. So we can see this, right? Not yet. So Not what yet. we're doing here is we're gonna set up, I, I set up the scope for Diva, four channels, and now I set the pins up for scope mode. You see that PADC scope? And, and you, uh, why, why is the filtration needed for scope mode? Uh, well, because- I, my, my, uh, I'm sorry to be so simple, but- uh, Because you can't, you, you have, what we're gonna do is we wanna see, we just have a limited resources in the smart pin, right? We can dedicate 68 flops to a big chain. And so yeah. we want to use that as like a storage. So we shift every ADC sample into that thing. So oh, something okay. oh, I see. I see. I, I'm beginning to see. You, you mean you're filtrating so, so that you, your array will look nice? Will, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I see. So, so it's, not, it's not a matter, you know, sort of see. I, 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 yeah, I, don't I mean, we, we, we yeah. could do something like we could just add up. Every time a bit goes in, a one bit goes in, increment your DC. You're, you're reading. Every time a one comes out of the other end, decrement it. The trouble with that is it's noisy, right? But by having uh -huh. these nice side lobes and these filter functions, I see. Smooths, it smooths out and becomes way better. Right. Okay, so, uh-oh. Getting myself into trouble here. Let me get rid of this. Okay, so back to this code here. So in this <clears throat> case, we set up scope mode, and then we set up triggers. So the, every scope pin also has two eight or two six bit trigger values, but they're moved up two bits. So we're gonna say when you go from 78 to say 88, that's a trigger, right? And we can then look at the pin to know when it went. It first has to arm at 78. And then when it, and, and, then, it, and then when it goes over 88, because of which one's higher versus lower, it sets up the slope direction. So in this case, this is the first, we arm at 78, we trigger at 88. Okay. And then uh, this controls what filter function. Zero is the 68 tap two key. That's the nicest looking one, but it's the lowest bandwidth one. So then we have an assembly language program, some inline assembly here that waits for a, a trigger on the first pin. And then it, uh, does a capture using the streamer. It just, right here, we, we, we control the frequency and we set the streamer mode up and we say capture 512 samples. And, right. then, and, then, and then we wait for that job to finish. And then we send that data to the scope. So when mm -hmm. I run this program, okay, now let me get some, let me get some action here. I gotta go. 
take, uh, oh, you know what? I'll use the other. I have the, the other board because it's a little quieter. I'm going to use the P2E valve because it just worked out better on this one because it's a lower noise board. Now, mm -hmm. no. so I have my, my uh, function generator here is making a ramp, right? I can select a square wave, mm -hmm. sine wave, and I've got four channels here. And uh, like if I connect, I can take that channel zero and also connect it to channel three, I guess it would be, let's see here. I'm feeding in on yep. one. Yep, can I ask a question? Of course. There's Would another. all this kind of output be compatible to using a program such as processing? What is processing? Um, it's it's a program of, for, for taking the data from, uh, from whatever you're doing and putting it in a graphical format. I used it on... Um, on one of my parallax projects where I had a bunch of uh, um, pings. And instead of trying to see stuff in lines of numbers that the pings were putting out, I had them put it in, I went into processing and had it come out as a graphical interpretation. So each ping was represented by a circle and it got bigger or smaller on oh. a graphical background so I could actually see what the pings were doing without having to think about the numbers and see the numbers. Yes. And I okay. can look at these circles get bigger and smaller. Well, if, if ping can accept serial... It's very popular. Input. It's used a lot with the Arduino and other processors. That's why I was wondering. Okay. So I don't... If, I mean, if we can send that thing serial messaging or, or, or load a file to it, that would work. But we have facilities in our debug... Yes, we, you can. Okay, then you could you could do that. But within our debug setup, we have uh, like I think eleven or twelve different debug displays. Like this is a, a up to eight channel scope display here, and uh, we also have a plotter that you can use for any kind of purpose. And you could you could send it live data. You just have to you know write the um, command codes for it so that it drives it in the way you want. But you could do all that stuff using the built-in debug facilities in the, P, in the in Peanut, which will soon be in Propeller Tool also. Yeah, to John, who just sent a question. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, which you can probably just find by Carol Hazlett, YouTube and Google it, um, I do have some demos there using different parallax sensors. Okay. And the processing is picking up the data coming out. You can set it up in many different ways. The thing with processing is you can, uh, it's a very easy graphical interface to use and it's Java oriented so that you can uh, take whatever's coming from your serial output and give it backgrounds and graphs and whatever you need to make it all very good. The reason I'm asking is because more people know processing than yeah. would know this and it'd be easier to use and definitely for me since I know processing. But yeah. this is all kind of like what the heck is he doing and how's he doing it? <laughs> Carol, Carol, this comes from processing.org. Yeah, processing.org. That's it. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a matter of time before somebody makes some examples that use processing to graph. Just checking it out, it looks like it's a matter of substituting PS or serial object and then formatting it the right way. I'm going yeah. to try it. That'd I mean, be a have... great project, Carol. Yeah, because I have used processing with the Propeller 2. You'll see that on, uh, or not the Propeller 2, the Propeller 1. And you'll see that on what I the few things I do have right now on my YouTube channel of it. We have, I mean, I don't know how processing works, but I tried to make our, all of our debug things as simple as possible. So see, here's the scope that I'm using right now. This, and these are all the commands for it. You just, you have some instantiation commands and then some feeding commands. And that's all there is to it. 
you know, here we're, we're, we're just sending it data. I, just, I haven't used the debug yet, so I don't know. But it all yeah. looked like the same kind of thing I was dealing with the processing. It's, a, it's probably similar, but we have quite a few. I mean, we have a, a logic analyzer, which is, whoops, this thing here. We have an, an eight-channel scope. Uh, we have a vector display uh, with log, log and normal mode. We have an FFT. Um, we've got... But yeah, all those uh, tools are, are readily available or makeable. In yeah, the yeah. It, it's all in the Spin2 documentation. See, here's the general purpose plotter. You could use this to generate all kinds of uh, like live circle drawings to show like how much signal you're getting back from a ping. Here's the little, uh, whoops. Here's a little terminal that I was using before. Here's a little uh, data fed bitmap. You can do whatever you want. It has quite a few different ways you can feed data into it. And, uh, and then we have different color modes so that you could simulate things that you're actually gonna have the hardware do. And we even have like a MIDI thing. Ah, uh, that's for me. <laughs> Except I don't I use MIDI, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, let me get this thing out of the way. So. Um, Chip, before we leave Carol's question, it would be good for us to have processing examples on our website because it's a whole other ecosystem. Yes. And if anybody wants to produce processing equivalents from Chip's debug, examples which are shown in the documentation he's showing which are linked from the link that I posted into the chat. We'd love to have them and I'd be glad to uh, help you with whatever your currency is whether it's free hardware or robot parts or whatever. Mm. Thanks. That includes you Carol. I know you have time on your hands. Uh, so. Not so much. You should see what Bill got me for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it seems like it should just be a matter of, of stub converting the serial output from the debug statements to processing. It looks right. that way in my little brain. Or just write, write processing statements as serial outputs. Yeah, but it'd be nice if it just worked with your built-in debug. Yeah. Uh, and parsed it and then just produce processing output. Does anyone know how many... Um, how many different types of displays there are for processing? It's a graphical interface, so it, 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 it's really, really functional. There, there's a bunch of YouTube videos on it. There's a guy okay. named Daniel Schiffman at uh, a university in New York, and he's like the processing guru. He's one of the guys that wrote it. It's really, really a great program. Yeah, it's, 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 it's been, been around for years. years. Yeah, it's probably not fair, but I like to think of it because I'm an old guy as the Orlin graphics interface for the new generation of, of things. Like if you remember BGI on that uh, Turco Pascal world. Ah. Yeah, I've never heard of it. I, I made a bunch of displays that seemed useful to me, but and they're tightly integrated into the whole development tool so that they don't have much overhead. Um, but you know they, they do there is they're, they're all a little bit unique. I'm sure they're different than processing, but I made them as terse as I could so that you don't have to do a lot of stuff to set up things. And this will this will really shine when Jeff gets it into the prop tool. And when because, when is that? Yeah, it, thanks, Roy. <laughs> I was literally waiting to ask Jeff because then we won't have to use any other tools. I, I I'm hoping to present it next week. Ooh. Ooh, nice. All right. Good job. And then is Gerald here? Because he was working on the C++ port of it. I guess mm -hmm. he's not. Chip, did you send him the latest uh, Delphi stuff so he could update his C++? No, I need to connect with him. He didn't, I didn't get any like certain ask from him, but I can send it to him. Um, but maybe he'll, he'll probably be on tomorrow because I know he knows Wednesdays. Well, the thing with processing that's nice is it's not uh, software dependent. You can use it with any 
other language because you're strictly just taking the data coming out of your serial port and that and then putting it in processing and using the processing based on java and just uh writing your whole own output program for that serial data it, it just feeds into it so you can do it with any chip or any program that you want you know it's not specific to just one type of right. chip family or that right i started using it with the arduino and then i got born out of the arduino world <laughs> Yeah, it'll it'll produce I like your guys applications that will run on any platform. I believe it's JavaScript, not Java. And it's also got now they've just come out with a Python head for it, so you can write Python. Yeah, too. it's definitely Java, uh, but there is a JavaScript port of it called um, P P five Java or something like that. It's in the um, uh, chat. Yeah, it's just called P5JS, and it's literally a processing API showing up as JavaScript uh, code. I liked it because it was very intuitive. I didn't have to do a lot of research or anything to find the command or format or whatever I needed to make my data look the way I wanted it to look. Well, that's what I've tried to do with this debug stuff. If you look at the highlighted code, see here we set up a scope. We're going to call it S. We say where on the screen we want it. How big is it? How many samples? What's the update rate? And then this, and we're, we're using packed data. And then I declare these four input channels, give them names. And so I'm saying that the bottom bar is zero, the top bar is 255, and I want that to be 255 tall on the screen with an offset of 10 in the window, and then I only want legends for the first channel. And then here I feed it. And so once that's set up, I just, I can feed it packed data, which is just a bunch of hex. And then it picks the data apart and then fills up the, uh, the scope display. So mm. when I run it, we get this. Now, if you notice this up here was 333 megahertz. So what that means is that, and you also see here we have the set Q8000, that's like full blast. 4000 would be half rate, but this is full blast. So what we're getting is every sample on the screen was a three nanosecond. That was at each three nanosecond time division what the ADC filter was outputting. And then I what's can- the, uh, What's the frequency of the sine wave that I see? That's one megahertz. Here, I'll make it two megahertz. Oh, that, oh, that's amazing. That's fantastic. There's two it, megahertz. It's, and it's so the, nice and smooth. Yeah. Now, now see the filter? The filter, the sine wave, you don't really see it on a sine wave, but when I go to a square wave, see the yeah. edges are a little rounded yeah. because as the data goes through that 68 tap filter, it uh, it takes some transition time, right? It, it's slewing. Uh, yeah, it's slewing, but watch this. By changing this by going to the next filter setting, a uh -huh. little sharper. Uh -huh. now. And then and if I go to the last filter setting, which is the shortest filter. Uh -huh. So we you've get got, more. You, and you've got some ringing. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's like a little <laughs> stroke. Yeah, and let me see, I'll go to three megahertz. At some point, we start <laughs> suffering attenuation because of the analog yeah. front end in the ADC. Here's four megahertz. That's fantastic. That's one wonderful. Five megahertz. See, we start to lose. Yeah. You know, but if I go back to one megahertz, it's like very clear. And then here's a uh, here's a sign. So see, with these lower res filters, you get better phase performance, but you get a noisier signal. Ah, uh, yeah. And then, okay, now you see this is, uh, th this here is full blast. Like I can change the sample rate to half. I can change at 80 bazillion to four bazillion. Mm -hmm. And that will, so now it's sampling like every other one. But see the nice thing about the scope output is, it is a finished filtered result available on 
any clock. You don't have to wait for any kind of like, um, you know, time division. You can sample it at any random time. I mean, I could even put in here like seven or six, right? Okay. And we can get all these intermediate sample rates. I can go down to like, uh, well, I could put like a one there. So now it's gonna, now we're looking at every eighth sample. And this is a sine uh -huh. wave and then here's a square wave. Uh-huh. So, oh. so this, so nice. with the scope mode and then the streamer being able to capture, it's just like a little oscilloscope and it captures four eight bit channels at once because that's 32 bits. That's as much pipe as we have back to the main memory, 32 bits. So 32 bits per clock, it's grabbing those scope channels and writing them to hub memory. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Last thing I had prepared was this scope. Now, if I go to like 100 kilohertz, and then if I go to sine, boom, and then I can go back and let's make the prettier filter because now we're lower frequency. There, that looks better. Yeah, isn't it? It beats uh, turning knobs on an oscilloscope. Yeah, yeah, you can just do it programmatically now. I mean, we yeah. could even go. We could even go to like, uh, how about instead of, you know, this was 100%, right? But what is, what is this? This is like one in 127 or one in 128. So if I slow down, let's go to 10 kilohertz. Whoops, that's 10 hertz, hold on. <laughs> yeah, so there's 10 kilohertz being sampled very seldomly. Oh. So you can set the sample rate. Hey, nice. 32 hey, nice. bits of, yeah. of timing precision. Mm -hmm. And then you, this number up can be up to 64K right here for how many samples to grab. Uh, uh, and as I understand it, this is one cog, cog doing the sampling and then one cog doing the uh, filtering? Uh, no, well, the filtering happens in the smart pin. This is all one cog. There's only one cog running here. Only one cog. It does, it does some little inline assembly to turn, to like set up the scope, wait right. for a trigger, and then capture so many signals. If we didn't wait for a trigger, the data would be all over the place, right? But by waiting for a trigger before capture, then we're, uh, we're, we're getting nice registered data that's repetitive. So it waits for the trigger, captures 512 samples, and then it comes out of there, and then here it, it outputs those 512 samples to the scope display. And in essence, your trigger is, is going to be whenever the, uh, the input goes from 78 to 88. Yes, yes, as seen right yep. here. Right. Yeah, and that's really the two LSBs of both of those, of each of those values is ignored. But in the case of the lower one, the two LSBs are actually the filter number. Uh, ah. Yeah, so see, we can, we can of change. Which 30, yeah, of, of which yeah. you could make as many as 32, you said. Uh, yeah, there's, the filter can become smaller. Here's a, here's a filter that will cap, we'll capture something earlier. See how the beginning, it's like. Uh, yeah, it's, it's setting the, the, the threshold. Yeah, yeah. So there's an arm point and a trigger point. Mm hmm Anyway, that was all the stuff I prepared for today. I didn't have any, I, I was working all night. I, I didn't get into the D to A, but it worked out just fine. This has taken like an hour and a half. And uh, we can cover the D to A, which is also, we have parallels for digital to analog to all this stuff I've shown you for analog to digital. We have like, you know, scope mode where you can output, you can stream four eight bit samples from memory at full blast and shoot them to mm -hmm. four different pins. And we have oversampling uh, smart pin modes that can do 16-bit oversampling. And uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff like that that uh, I can cover next time. When is, when is the next time? If I'm, I'd like, when is, uh, before uh, Christmas or after Christmas? Ken, are you still there? Yeah. Um, the next time is next Wednesday. Same, same time. Um, it's a little bit late for you. Sorry about that. We could actually have it earlier in the day, too, That's since fine. many people are on break and they'll they'll be able to attend. So maybe we'll do that.
but I think it was good, Chip, that you broke up the A to D and the D to A into two different sharing episodes. Yeah. Now it's doing a sweep. Yeah, so it just, just turns out we, we ran out of uh, time anyway, but. Well, this is enough for one day and reading the comments, I think people got what they needed from it. So let's see if anybody has questions too that have not been answered here. So everybody knows now how to do a simple analog input with the P2? Yeah, if you publish that file, it'll, it is easy, but you know, the smart pins, they, they're it's such that I can't just off the top of my head type smart pin code. I have to go back to the documentation because there's a lot of little stuff that you can do. And so you need to like, I have to go back and myself and realize, okay, I need this setting and this setting and I need to do this this way. And so I, I have to, it never winds up being much code, but there's like a lot of stuff possible. So you need to look at the docs to keep it straight. Yeah, and sometimes the low level pin settings uh, factor in as well. Like yeah. Schmidt trigger mode versus regular and stuff like that. Right, oh yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, you could build just out of the smart pins, you could build, um, you know, Schmidt relaxation oscillators and, and then run a smart pin counter on that and so that you can do like, you know, LRC to frequency. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. You can build op amps. So Chip, um, a couple of questions. What's the amplitude of the waveform? VPP? Uh, 3.3, 3, 0 to 3.3 volts. Oh, but you know what? Watch this. I, let's go to like 10X mode, right? See that? So now we're gonna see some horrendous clipping, but if I go to, uh, let's see, my span, whoops, hold on here. Let's see, sign. More A to D questions while Chip uh, plays with the hardware. We can queue them up here. You could use the chat if you want. I'm gonna make the, uh, Now this should be okay. Now, okay, now look. Okay, now I'm getting smaller here. Yeah. Now, now I've got a 147 millivolt signal, and I've got it. Yeah. The offset is 1.65 volts. So. So you see now we're we're at like 10x. You see it. And I can I can go further. I could go to like a hundred x. Hundred x gets really it's touchy because the center point. So let me just keep dropping this here and see if we can get. Oh, oh, almost there. So while Chip does this for the next P two live forum, when we talk about the DAC or prop tool, we could move it to Tuesday next week since people are generally on breaks if that's preferred, because on Wednesday we have Johnny Mac, and I fear that might be a bit too much to have six hours of P2 fun in one day. So maybe yeah. we should, what do you think? Keep the P2 form on Tuesday next week? I'd vote for Tuesday next week. Okay, and that I, way for- Yeah, this, I'm okay Tuesday's too. good. Yeah. I'm very interested in the doc uh, presentation, so. Okay, and we, we could even move it a little earlier on Tuesday to help out the Europeans. No, 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 that's, that, uh, that's fine for me. If I'm, if I'm the only European, I, 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 I work all night, so. Well, there's another Frenchman who's, who is uh, oh, yeah? hanging around, but he had to go to bed and he's very interested in the MicroPython uh -huh. okay. material. <laughs> Good, well. Uh, I'm, we could pull it in an hour. I think uh, nobody else will mind. No, yeah, I'm, I'm off all next week, so. I'm good. You're welcome. <laughs> hey, look at yeah. this. Do you see this here? Let's see here. Offset. Let me go. Uh, let me lift it up a little bit. This is a 40 millivolt peak to peak signal. It's a, it's a, uh, let's see, what have we got here? 
what is the frequency? It's 100 kilohertz sine wave, 40 millivolts peak to peak. And then here's the square wave. So you see at the 100x setting, it's very sensitive. So, mm -hmm. but, this is, but this whole thing is just 40 millivolts peak to peak. Very nice. And that's that's its highest amplification. So if you were to build an op amp uh, from two pins uh, or three pins, you would uh, you that's that'd be difficult then because um, if that's the maximum gain. Well, yeah, you, you, you have a small window, but see right now I am DC coupling and I'm telling the function generator that, let's see, yeah. it's, uh, let's see here, where is it? It's offset is 1.652 volts, right? If I move it up here, I'll move it up one millivolt. There, one millivolt. Oh yeah, millivolt. nice. Mm -hmm. You can see it moving here. I'll move it, I'll move it 10 millivolts. Whoop, that was too far down. Whoop, too far up. <laughs> I, um, yeah. But if I if I were to AC couple this, like if I had a capacitor that was easy to get a hold of right now, and I were to put that in line, I could get rid of that warbliness. See that warbly looking thing? Yeah, How it's kind of wobbling. If I could AC couple, I could get rid of that. And it's, why why is it happening? I think it's just the ground difference between my test equipment and my board and the power oh, yeah. supplies and the PC. Uh, I mean, that, that wobbling is really like five millivolts or so, right? Or th yeah. three or four millivolts. But, but if I could AC couple, I could get rid of that. I just don't see uh, a capacitor. Yeah, I just don't have a capacitor. <laughs> I don't have one that's easy to get to. Let me look here. Here's a cap. Let's see. What's. Well, you, uh, the traces that you show are much better than my digital scope, I must say. In my digital <laughs> scope has, has all kinds, you know, it has eight bit, uh, I think it has eight bit A to Ds. And of course, you, you see the little steps and the little like pixel things and then they're never stable. Whereas oh, your, yeah. sine, your sine wave is, is beautifully rounded. So congratulations. I think it's a Stay nice here. scope. Oh, thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just now. Now I'm, I'm AC coupling. I guess we still have some wobble in there. Yeah, but it is 40 millivolts peak to peak. I mean, if you look at how quiet the flats are, that's like less than a millivolt. Yeah. About a challenge chip and do a Lisa Jew with it. What Lisa Jew. <laughs> What is that? Is that some kind of pattern? That's two <laughs> sine waves. Uh, you uh, you put one, two signals that you put in X, uh, in the X and the Y direction so that they combine and make circles. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I could do that because we have an X Y scope mode. We could totally do that. Uh -huh. I just Wait. don't have. I only have a uh, a one output function generator though. But you know what? We could use other pins to generate those signals and then read them back. We could use DAC pins yeah. and programs driving them. To that, would be, that would be very exciting for the next, for Tuesday. To okay. See, uh, to see a uh, function generation with the, with the P2. Uh, yeah. For example, you know, uh, triangle waves, sine waves, uh, sawtooth, et cetera. Yes. Et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I just got a function generator for Christmas, so I think, I, think I know what I'm going to do. But you, you'll have a P2. You don't need function generator anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. My husband <laughs> got me a, a new oscilloscope, a function generator, and a yeah. new bench power but supply. This scope, the debug scope, is absolutely beautiful. It's really, it really is an achievement. And uh, congratulations, Chuck. Thanks. Chip. Yeah, it was, it was fun. And you know, I, well, I, I don't know if you were here, but I made all sorts of anti-alias line drawings. Everything that's displayed is anti-aliased. Uh -huh.
But in this case, uh -huh. because we're, it's like the samples are back to back, there's no, there's no distance over which the anti-aliasing could occur. But if I were to like do something like shorten, let's see, if I go here and I put, let's say 200 samples, right? And I capture 200 and here I put 200, but over that longer distance, <clears throat> Oh, well now we're all, we're not registered anymore to our, uh, yep. oh, I have to change this rate here. There we go. So now there's a little more opportunity for the anti-aliasing. Let's see, where's our frequency sign? I go mm. back to a megahertz there. Mm. Anyway. It's exciting. So I don't want to derail the fun chip because there's a lot of it happening, but Bart has a non-analog input question to ask. Okay. Bart, I'm sorry to uh, change the subject a little bit. I, um, I've been uh, absent from the calls for a couple months now. Um, day job got in the way. Um, but I've been playing uh, still with uh, digital video, um, the HDMI modes. And uh, I've explored... Uh, RD Fast and the uh, um, streamer, and also did some uh, really delved into the alt, like alt i instructions as well. Um, that's all been a lot of fun. Um, but a couple questions. Um, the first one is, I'm trying to set up. I, I apologize, I don't have good code to show you kind of the quagmire I've got myself into. But um, I'm trying to set up a uh, like a display list kernel where uh, in, uh, for every, any given scan line, there'd be a display list for um, ranges of pixels. And I'm, it, seems to, it seems to sometimes work and depending on where the, uh, for example, sorry, uh, 320 pixels and then 320 pixels of a different color or 320 pixels from this address to in the first half of the scan line to 320 pixels to the second, uh, from a second address on the second half of the scan line. And it's that handoff between the two, like when I have to load RD fast for the second one, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, okay, I see. So yeah, so you need to, the, the streamer will internally buffer two whole commands, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So you need to be sure to keep that pipe filled. But are you trying to do more than that? Like, are you trying to have one cog give it a command and then another cog give it a command? Well, I'm working up to that. Um, and I, I that, that would be a little trickier. You'd have to like really be time aligned, which you yeah. could probably do at the very outset of the whole. Once the app, once that little app starts, lock them up, and then thereafter, as long as you agree on what cycle you're on you should be able to switch between. Well, so yeah, the, that was a uh, the question I had was about the, um, the queuing. Um, Cause it seems like uh, without, it's, it's really difficult to kind of introspect what's happening here, but it seems like the streamer commands are queued up, but the RD fast is happening, oh, yeah, is, yeah, is, yeah, is yeah, not yeah, queued okay. up. Is, right, does, right. Is it, that does takes R, time. Does, so does the RD fast, um, does the RD fast have a, a queuing as well? Yeah, it takes, it takes uh, I don't know, what is it, 8 to 13 clocks or something? Or 8 to 15 clocks? I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Look. Let's see here. Let me go to the instruction thing. RD fast. Uh, uh, 206, hold on. Here we go. Okay, now let me go. It's uh, okay. So it's going to take ten to seventeen clocks. Okay. And okay. and so that's I don't know. I, I see what you're doing. You know what? The only way this is going to work probably is if you could tolerate that much time in your scan line. So you're probably re running at 250 megahertz to get HDMI? Yep. Okay, so, and so your pixel rate is 10 clocks. So this is the problem, is that 
you're running over budget by at least seven clocks sometimes. Yeah, that sounds right. And then you have to add in a few more clocks for the for the for the uh, x continue or x zero instruction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. So you'd have to really stage your data or have another cog be ready to pick up the second the streamer command left off on the first cog or cog A, then cog B steps in with a queued up read fast to start sending more data. I think that's the only way you're gonna do it unless you, you can stage all the data say in the LUT, which you know what, that, that might work. You could, you could maybe pre-stage the data. We, you get a, you're gonna pull it out of hub memory, so it has to be in the hub. Yeah. Or it could be, it could be, I mean, you have enough time, you could do discrete commands for feeding it data out of the, out of the LUT too. But you're going to, if you use one cog, you're going to have to stage your data so that you don't suffer this read fast penalty. Or you're going to have to have another cog be ready on the, on the spot to do a switch off in one clock, right? And then he takes <laughs> over. Yeah. And you can do that. It's not, I mean, the code for it would be nothing. It's just getting there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, making yeah. sure you're locked up. Okay. Well, the thing you mentioned about the LUT, I mean, that, that actually does sound like it would work. Uh, but the, just to be, just to bounce an idea off you, I, I wouldn't be able to do an entire scan on. I'd still have to trade off ha like at least halfway through. Yeah. At, at, 24, at 24 bits. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. Because you don't have the, the memory. If you had... Um, I wish I had put, I was thinking the other day, I wish I had put in a 24 bit, you know, we have like RF byte, RF word, RF log. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. have RF theirs. I should have made an RF RGB that would grab the next three bytes. And then we oh, could yeah. have had the streamer use that. And we would have had, we would have saved a, a fourth of the memory on big screens. Mm. But we don't have that. But anyway, here's, here's how it would work between two cogs. Remember that all, if any cog says an IO pin is high, then that pin is high, right? Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is you want to have cog A begin outputting zero bits. In other words, turn off, basically shut down, shut the streamer off so it outputs zero bits at the same time the other streamer steps on and then starts outputting the... Uh, the uh, next word or the next packet of uh, what is it called? The HDMI data. Yeah. I, I, I think I'll have to, I'll have to work up to that. I <laughs> think it's but the timing of where I am right now. It's like, uh, it's, it's a little tricky. I, I'm trying to actually also, also on top of all of that, do this in interrupt so that it, it does the, it steps up the streamer and the RD fast in an interrupt, and then can go back to doing other stuff in the same cog. Yeah. Um, Did, you know, we have a guy named Roglo, Roger, he's in Australia, and Brian and Lachlan know him. I don't know if he's on this thing right now, but he, he might have written what you're, what you're doing right now. Do yeah, either I, of you guys know? Or go ahead, Bart. Well, from my last, from the last time I asked you know, HDMI related questions, yeah, somebody mentioned Roger and they had a, a driver that could do, you know, DVI. But I actually, the question I had at the time was about audio over HDMI. And oh, oh, oh. Somebody, somebody mentioned that he actually had a, a version working um, and that there was like headphones.spin2. So that was the second question I had is if anybody knew where that piece of code was. But yeah, I'll, I I'll do that. I'll see if I can reach out to him. Some stuff demonstrated, which we, Brian and I, um, he came over and demonstrated one day. Um, and I can't honestly remember whether it was P2 or a P1V setup, but he did manage to get audio working over HDMI. Um, because, yeah, I remember we, we tried it with some different monitors and some worked and some didn't, I think, from memory. Mm. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's worth asking the question, Roger. It's a bit early for him to to do these kind of conferences, but but okay. um, well, well, I'll reach I'll reach out to him on the forum. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Fine. Just ask. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, clearing that up. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Oh yeah, you bet. Yeah, someday oh. I want to get into all that kind of stuff too. 
Oh, I, actually, I did another question was re regarding uh, alt, the alt instructions. Uh, and that is that um, when, when you do something like uh, alt i and it loads up the r, d, or f, r, or d, and or s, um, that puts it into pipeline. And so the value that had been in the register that was pulled in to the pipeline, that register can then actually be changed, right? There's no, right. I don't have to like wait clocks. No, 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 no. It, it happens that. Okay. Quick. And you know, okay. there's a whole bunch of unexplored stuff. You can compound alt instructions. You could have alt instructions modifying alt instructions that modify some instruction that is the point of what you're doing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was it was mind bending enough, I think, to work with like alt that is that's already changing three of the all three parameters. Um, oh yeah, I think having an alt. Say, yeah, just a straight a straight alt i will use a constant for s that will swap out the entire instruction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I might actually be doing that. Because I'm I'm using the alt stuff in two different places, um, in a different way in the two different places. Um, okay, well, thanks. That answers all of my questions. Um, thanks a lot. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, you got a lifetime to figure it out, Bart. <laughs> sure, but it, you know, it's impatient though. You know, like I want to see the thing come to life. Now, hi, Chip. I have another question for you. Um, with your current debug output, um, the nice thing is that you can compile with debug or without, and then the debug output is not in there. Um, is it possible to send data with that debug statement that a normal terminal can output it? Wait, is it possible to send data with the debug statement that what can output it? Just, just normal serial data, because then you could kind of put some debug statement in and send it to processing. Oh yeah, yeah. That that's what. Yeah, the deep, the raw debug statement can send anything. Yeah. But see, okay. I use that little backtick thing as like a little trigger character for the for the debug displays the graphical debug is to key off of. But yeah, it's just it's just serial. The debug statement just spews out serial. It can be whatever you want. So when I said just a simple string in debug without any backticks, it would basically send that string. Yeah. You can you can totally control what gets sent out, yes. So then then kind of attaching to processing shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, uh, it may not be. Who wants to do it? I mean basically, you know. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing on the debug is that you can compile with and without, which is kind of like an if dev, which you don't support yet. <laughs> right. Yeah, if you, I, I have to do control F10 to run this scope display. If I just do F10, it compiles the program without any of the debug statements, mm. and then it runs it, and it doesn't open up any debug windows. Yeah, that's very nice. Slowly, I like it. <laughs> yes, if I just run it, it that, that's it. It's, it's running now, but it's not doing anything. But control F10 causes the extra compilation and the debug window to open. Hey, Ken. Yes. What's next? What should we do next? I here's my situation here. I've got all of my my wife's brothers are here except one. We've got four brothers and two of their kids. Yeah, you've done your job today. <laughs> so we can let you go. All right. And um we'll we'll end this if that's okay, because I have similar obligations, unless somebody else wants to take over host and keep the chatting going, which is an option. Now Michael could do that. <laughs> I have a quick been, question. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, Chip, I just tried to download and run Peanut 35B with the ADC on my retro board and I'm having issues. It, it started off, I couldn't find it. I'm not sure whether it's a, a two megabaud issue because I can see it's outputting. Runs perfectly fine on the eval. So I know the code and that's working. Um, can you slow the speed over the interface in case it's my UART not keeping up, my USB one? Um, can you, you can put a delay command into the debug statement. But I can't, I can't change it from two megaboard, it's fixed. No, no, it's, it's kind of all set up that way. Uh, wait, can you do that? No. I can, I can download it to Megaboard and I get I download with um, um, load P2 fine at 2 meg and I'm loading big files like 128 KB. No worries. But I've just did a little bit of a loss as to what where to look. It, it would be nice if the debug output could be configured to different baud rates. Yeah, yeah, I know it would be. So uh, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure that that's the issue because I had trouble finding the board in the first place. In other words, it wasn't finding the P2. Yeah, hold and on. I got to step out. I'm going to be right back. My brothers-in-law are leaving right now, but I got to talk to him really quick. I'm going to be right back. Okay. Okay. Just yeah, you take your time, Jeff. Hold on. Sorry, I didn't family. realize he was in that much of a hurry. Well, it is <laughs> December 22nd. It's uh, family <laughs> holiday times. Yeah. He, he does this routinely, so we'll have to let him go at some point here. Yeah, yeah, no worries. We'll come back. I, and... I, can ask, I can ask him over email. So that's not an issue. So, so Ken, I, yeah. I just was scanning some of the processing stuff, mm -hmm. and it looks like you could just send it the serial stream coming out of the debug stuff and write a script to parse that serial stream and produce visual displays. Like, you Would you even to... need to, to do the parsing? Can't you just do that straight out of the P2 code? Well, no, no, no. I'm saying the P2 output, the serial output that it outputs for the debug mode is a string per output, right? that we would need to parse to then draw the appropriate line or data from that debug uh, serial stream. But what, I, what I'm getting at is we don't have to like convert the serial stream to some other serial stream. We can literally just process it right in processing with scripting to, you know, parse Quite doable the, then. It, it seems like it's very doable. It's just, the main thing would be hooking into that serial stream appropriately so you can see the displays, uh, you know, like, cause right now peanut, when you hit control F10, uh, it produces the window and is holding on to that serial port. Yeah. So we would need a mode to be able to run on the P2, but not consume the serial port and let processing consume the serial port. Right. Um, what I did, was I sent the data to a COM port on the computer and then I used the processing to directly pick up whatever data was coming through that COM port. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. I had like six well, different sensors that I wanted it to pick up and display at once. So I had to format that data no, Roy? to go to each graphical. There's a debug pin variable which you can direct. Does that help you? Um, oh, so you can set which serial pin the debug output goes to? Correct. Okay, yeah, that, that would work also. But I'm, I, I think it would work fine with the main one. We just need the ability to run a program with the debug output without peanut bringing up the windows itself and I think when you consuming the serial port. Correct. I think what happens is when you set a debug pin, it no longer consumes a port. Right, but I'd want it to use the regular serial port, just like the peanut does. Like
like the whole idea is that you would run MicroPython on the P2 and run a program that has debug stuff in it and see it the same way you would if you ran like with Mew or whatever. And similarly, when PropTool or Peanut, when it runs, I want to be able to compile and run, but not go to those displays, go to processing instead. It's just a technical thing of of taking over the serial port, right? Peanut currently yeah. holds on to it. Yeah, and a lot of, lot of the like Arduino tool at eChains, they kind of manage the serial port so they can play these funny games. Uh, we'd have to have the level of coordination somewhere in the system, and I don't know how to abstract that out, but I think everybody kind of sees what the path forward might be on that. Yeah, and it seems like the value of it really is more with uh, Mu and Python than it would be with Windows and PropTool and Spin2, because Chip's given us this in fully integrated, and it's coming into prop tools, so. Yeah, but we can't add our own. With processing, we can add our own and do whatever okay. the hell we want. Yeah. Right. And the yeah. other <laughs> part is that um, processing runs on different OSs. I Big mean, point. On Linux, it runs on Mac, it runs for every Arduino guy. I mean, I never had one of them, but um, basically it is, if, and, we talked about that before, that it would be nice to have also those debug windows from chip not integrated into prop tool, but as a single application. So you could use it from, I mean, even talk to them screens from micro pythons. Yeah, well, that's we what Gerald, Gerald is working on the C++ port of it, which would be sort of a standalone app to display all the windows from the serial stream. Yeah. And if we have that, then it, that can be used with like FlexProp and right. any, and then, anything then, instead then of being locked into prop need, tool. Then we would basically need one of those constants for debug, like debug pin, and a constant for debug program, which should, or maybe use- I don't think we need any of that. It would just like use that. the same serial stream. That it yeah, yeah. Does. just prevent, straight stereo stream. To, yeah. to prevent some screams to, to pop up, we would need kind of a control F10 if this debug, but without opening the debug screens, so we can use processing. Like, I mean, yeah, it's just a, a option on prop tool to run with debug, but don't bring up the debug windows. Exactly. It would be very easy for Jeff to add that, and then we can. Yeah. And then processing can be running and we can just attach to the COM port after the P2 is running and see all the displays. So, so here's, here's a wacky idea that someone kind of alluded to in the chat. And that's, you know, what if, uh, what if the prop tool, um, you could just tell it, hey, whatever comes from the serial port, uh, emit it to a UDP port, maybe even a multicast port somewhere uh, that, pro you know, dumb networking code can pick up on that, whether it's processing or just about anything else that can open simple sockets. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just written, written too much network code to be useful. In, in this <laughs> oh. Uh, what would be nice with a readout like this is if you could put a, what you could do if you were using processing, is if you could put a graph there so, so somebody looking at it could tell what range and what amplitude and everything these different uh sine waves are at yeah all the all the scales of the right. axes and then you could also probably even do things like capture single instances of a of a display and save them and keep a running uh set of data so that the data like this uh sine wave that we're seeing now could go in time depth wise and so you would see a surface of the sine wave changing shape right 